Hello class, we're going to talk about methods tonight. And uh, that's chapter six in our textbook. And the first thing that I wanted to point out to you is a little bit of an update that I did today. If you go into the module and open up the readings and exercises, I'm hoping you're doing this each week. I'm hoping that you're opening this up because this is a web page with learning resources for you. Uh, you will see the author's examples, the textbooks of the examples, and then another uh, project where I've got some more examples that I've made up. And just this afternoon, I added some more to this one here. So you might want to download that and follow along with me because I'm going to go through that project uh, tonight. And in fact, here's the very first example in that project. It's called Methods 1. Got it on the screen here. It's, it's rather a lengthy file, so I'm going to uh, go through it a little bit slowly. But the first thing I want to do is just point out the comments here at the top of the page. In case you didn't know what, what a method is all about, a method is like a function that belongs to the class. There are two basic kinds of methods. Void methods, just, just like in Python, I believe. Python is what you took before this. Void methods don't return a value back to the method that called them, typically the main method. And then you've got value returning methods that do return a value. Now you can only return one value, by the way. You can only return one value. Now you can get around that by creating something called an array, which is a, a, a group of values. But uh, we haven't covered that yet. That actually comes up in the next chapter, chapter seven. So you've got two kinds of methods. Keep that in mind as we go through the examples tonight here. When you define a method, you can specify parameters inside the parentheses. You call them parameters when you're defining the method. When you actually go to run or call the method, you specify arguments that must match the parameters in type and also in the same order. So in this particular example here, here's our, our main method, as you can see. But down below that, I've got a couple other methods here. Here's one called add to. First thing I want to point out is that they're always going to be public and static. Okay, we'll always write public and static methods. We have to make them static because for, in order to run a method inside main, because main is static, you can only run static methods in, in, in another static method, in this case, the main method. So we have to make all of our methods static. Public makes them uh, visible anywhere uh, in Java. Makes them, uh, gives them world access, if you like. <clears throat> now, we can see that this is a void method, this first one. That means it's not gonna return a value. It's gonna take two parameters. Now, we call these parameters, n1 and n2, both of type int. You have to type them. Didn't have to do that in Python. You have to type them in Java. And what we're going to do is we're going to add those two together into a variable called sum. And then we're going to print out the, the, uh, an expression showing the sum of those two integers. No return statement here in this void method. Let's look at the second method. It's somewhat similar. It's public static, but this one is, has a return type. This one is going to return an int back to main. We're going to call it in main. It, the name of the function is to add. It's going to take, once again, two parameters. I gave them the same names, m1 and n2. And this time, we're just going to return the sum. I didn't even bother to create an extra variable here. There's no need to create a variable called sum or total. We can just return uh, and use an expression to return what we get when we add them. So this, what this uh, method will do is it'll take whatever values we pass to it, they have to be two integers, and it'll add them both together and toss the result back to the method that called this, this method. So it's going to toss the value back into main. Okay, so now let's, let's take a look at how we could use that. Here we are back in main. We're going to declare a couple of integers, uh, num1 equals 10, num2 equals 20, and now we're going to call the add to function. That's the void one. So when we call it, all we have to do is uh, enter its name and give it two integers to work with. 
Now we've got to do that because that's the way we defined it. Now in this case, we call these numbers, these values are called the arguments. When you actually run or call the function, the method, the values that you give it to work with are called the arguments. Now the arguments get passed into the parameters. So in this particular case, for example, uh, num1 is going to get passed into n1, num2 is going to get passed into n2. Okay, that's the way it works with, with methods. <clears throat> now when, when a method returns a, a value, this one, this one doesn't, but if a method returns um, a value, you've got to catch it in some way, or it's like playing catch with somebody in the yard and they throw the ball over your head, you don't get to play with the ball anymore. Same thing is, works with uh, methods that return a value. You've got to catch the return value either in a variable or as an argument for another method, possibly the print or print line method. Here's, here's where we're going to use it. We're going to use the to add method here. The to add method returns a value. It's going to take our num1 and num2. As soon as the, as soon as the uh, Java, um, Java virtual machine gets to this line in the program, it looks to find this method, finds the method down here called to add, and it, it executes these instructions. And in this case, it's going to calculate the, the sum and return it. And we're going to catch that return value in this variable called total. Okay, now we can use that variable in some way. We could, for example, just print it out with system.println, as you can see here, we could just print it out. But we could also, since this method returns a value, we could also use it as the argument for a print right here. Right there, we're calling the toAd method inside the print line method. You can do that. Uh, you might, if, if you took Python recently, you might remember we used to call the format function inside the print function all the time in Python. Well, this is the same concept using methods in Java. We're embedding the to add method inside the print line method. Now, when the program control gets here, the Java virtual machine says, oh, there's something called to add down here. I got to go find it. It goes down and finds this method, runs all that code, returns the sum of the two uh, parameters, which then pops into here. So this actually gets replaced with an integer value, which then becomes part of the output of the print line. Now, this method, doing uh, the embedded method here, like, like we've got in, in line 28, this won't work if you have to use the return value later in the code, because we don't have the variable to work with. So, if we want to use the value later in the code for some reason, like for example, to calculate the tax on the total, 7% sales tax on the total, we would have to use the, uh, the, the first method where we catch the return value in a variable. So I'll just uh, give this program a run here and we'll see what the output is. And there's, there's the output. Obviously the sum is going to be 30. And the sales tax on, on $30 would be $2.10 in Pinellas County, anyway. Any questions about this one? That's a, a pretty good basic example of two different types of methods. Here's a void method, doesn't return a value. Here's a method that does return a value. In this case, it's going to return the sum of the two integers. All right, somebody else is joining us here. Zane, welcome Zane. Hmm. If you're okay with that one, I'm gonna move on to the next program. But feel free to ask a question at any time. Next one I wanna take a look at is called Methods 2. There it is. This one's a, a somewhat shorter one. And to see if I can get my Package Explorer back here. Okay. In this one, uh, we're going to demonstrate that you can call a method from another class. You can call a static method in another class. In order to do that, see, I'm in, an, I'm in a completely new program here now called Methods2, but I can run the Add2 method 
from the methods one class. As long as I reference it by using the class name, a dot operator, and then the name of the method. Now, in this case, I'm not using any variables. I'm using literal values to uh, as the arguments, right? We would call that the arguments to the method call. Uh, down here, we're going to create a couple of integers, and we'll uh, output a line of text here, really. And then we will finish this up by calling the um, to one, the to add method from the methods one class. So you'll see that often in Java. And actually we've seen it already with the math class. Recall how we use the math class. Whenever we want to use a method of the math class, we have to say capital M math dot and then the name of the method that we want. Well, that lets you know that all of the methods in the math class were static methods, right? Because you could only call them with the name of the class class name dot and then the name of the method. Well, we can do this as well with methods that we create. In this case, we're running some methods in methods two in a different program. We're running methods that we defined in the method ones program. Okay, now um, I'd like to move on. If you're okay with that one, any questions about that one, anybody? Welcome, Zane. Any questions about that one? Okay, good. All right, well, we'll move on then. Next one I'd like to take a look at is called um, pass by value. Take a look at pass by value. When you uh, re uh, execute a method in Java, the arguments are passed into the parameters by value. Okay, the arguments, remember, those are the values that the method actually uses when you call the method. And the parameters are the values that you uh, use to define the method. Well, the arguments are passed in by value. And what that means is that the parameter gets a copy of the argument value. And if you change that copy inside the method, that doesn't affect the argument back in, for example, back in the main method. There's a pretty good example in the book, by the way, listing 6.5 on page 215 that you should take a look at. But here's a similar example. Uh, we've got a very simple method down here called change num. It's going to take an integer parameter and it's going to return an int. And as you can see, all we're going to do here is we're going to multiply it by 10. We're using the times equals operator to return num times 10. Now let's see how we're going to use it up here. We declare an integer with a value of, of, of five. And we're going to print out its value, which of course is going to be a five when we print this line. And then we'll call the change num method. And because it returns a value, we can embed it inside the print line here. And that'll, that'll turn into a number, which we'll then output. And I, I guess it's going to be 50 since we're multiplying five by 10. And in fact, I think that what I'll do is I'll run this program here. And there it is. I think I'll put my... Console window down where it's usual location down the bottom here. Okay, so you can see that we do get a five from this first line here. We do get a 50 from this line, which is to be expected. And after we've called the uh, uh, method, there's no change. The variable num still has a value of five. So what we're trying to demonstrate here is we, we multiply the parameter by 10, but that doesn't affect the argument back here at all because the method gets a copy of the argument for its internal use, and that does not affect the value back in main. It's called pass by value in Java. And that's the way everything is done when you use methods in Java, pass by value. It's a very important concept. Are you okay with that one? Mm -hmm. like, I don't know if you expected that it was going to be changed here when we output it here. If you thought this was going to be a 50, for example, well, it's not. It stays at 5. Just before we go any further, I wanted to show you a very important uh, diagram in your textbook. It's actually on page 207. It's all about the parts of a method. This is pretty good stuff because you'll see this used constantly throughout the textbook. 
the, the first line when you're defining a, a method is called the method header line. It has the modifiers, public and static, has the return type, has a name, you have to give the method a name, and then it has uh, what are, are called parameters or formal parameters, separated by commas, they have to be typed inside the parentheses. Then you open a curly brace, and inside the curly braces, that's called the body of the method. It could be any number of lines in there. And since, since this uh, method returns an int, there has to be a return value here. Now, uh, Eclipse will help you if you forget to return a value like you're supposed to according to the method header. Eclipse will uh, give you a, a red warning about that. But get used to this terminology uh, when we're working with methods because you'll see it all the time from here on in the textbook. If you're okay with that, I'd like to move on to the next uh, example to take a look at here. And um, got one here called uh, return in void. This seems kind of odd, but a void method can actually have a return statement, but it's a blank return statement. It's just return and a semicolon. And it has one use, and that is to immediately stop the method and return control back to the method that called it. Typically, that would be main, but not necessarily. This is something that's rarely used in Java, but it is possible. And we made an example here to try to show you how that works. Um, we've got a method here called exchange currency. It's type void, so it's not going to return a value. It's going to take a, a double parameter. We call that a parameter called dollars. And I've got, right off the top here, we've got an if. And if the dollars is less than or equal to zero, uh, well, there's, you, there's no point in exchanging uh, currency if, if you don't have a number that's greater than zero. So what we're going to do is immediately stop this method if the value is zero or less, a negative number. And we'll, what we'll do is we'll print out a, a little message in valid input. And then, look, here's the blank return. Return semicolon, and that stops the method immediately. The rest of the method is ignored completely, which of course we would want to do in this case. So let's see how we could use that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use a scanner class here to get a value from the keyboard. That, that means we have to uh, import uh, java.util.scanner, of course. And um, as you can see, we are, uh, uh, I'm so, I'm, I, hear, I hear somebody typing. If you're typing these programs in, you don't have to. Uh, you can download them all, okay? I'll show you where you can get them if, if you miss that. Uh, anyway, um, we're going to use Scanner. We're going to ask the user to enter an amount in U.S. dollars, and we're going to convert it to Mexican pesos. Uh, we'll then use the, our Scanner object input and run the next double, because we want to get a value as a double. So we use the next double method. We'll then close using input.close. Now that's not in our textbook, but if you forget that, you get this nag, this little nag reminder up here that there's a resource leak because we haven't closed, we haven't closed that uh, object down, the input object. So in case you hadn't seen that, you can add that to your program. Uh, it's not in the textbook, it's an Eclipse thing and uh, you won't be, uh, deducted uh, any marks from your assignments for not closing, but just thought you'd like to see that. Now here's the method call here. It, uh, Eclipse, I, I don't know if you noticed that the method calls show up as uh, in uh, italics in, in Eclipse, and we're calling the method exchange currency, giving it the argument US, the argument, right? When you run or call the method, it's the argument. And so that's gonna run all this code down here. And then after this method runs, we're going to just output to Acme Money, the name of the company here. So let's give this a run and see what happens. So I'll enter, I'll try $100. $100 gets me uh, 1,919 pesos. Current rate, actually, I looked this up online just before class, 19.19 .19 pesos per US dollar is the current exchange rate. And you'll notice that I've used printf here to uh, get that value formatted with two decimal places. Well, uh, notice also we get the 
Acme money value being printed out down here. Because as soon as this method finishes, we get back up to this line in main. Well, I'll run it again and I'll put a, a bad input value in there, which I make minus two. And that gives us the error message that we've got inside of our if. But, but it doesn't even try to run this code because this immediately stops the method. And after the method stops, we get to see this line in main. So it's kind of a silly example, perhaps, but it shows you that um, you can use a blank return to immediately stop a method if you want. Okay. Any question about that one? Mm -hmm. I'll go kind of quickly here. Everything's good? Okay. Uh, Zing, yeah, you, you uh, joined us just a little bit late and uh, we got this file out of um, out of my courses. I'll just show you where it was. It's was right here, the instructor zip examples. That's where we got the project. Uh -huh. So if you, if you download that zip and import it, you'll see the same things that we're working on here. Okay. Okay. All right. Just one more example that I wanted to show you. And um, here it is. It's called uh, binary to decimal. And uh, in the textbook, they have a kind of an interesting example where they convert a uh, hexadecimal number into a base 10 decimal number. Well, <clears throat> we're going to try it here. We're going to try to convert a binary number into a decimal number. It's a little bit complex, but uh, I, th I think you can, uh, I think you can uh, understand it okay. Certainly ask questions if, if you can. But here's an example of a method. We call, I called it bin to deck. And by the way, that's the way you should name your methods. The method names begin with the lowercase character. If there's more than one word in the name of the method, you uppercase the first character in each word. And as you can see, this method is going to take a string as its parameter called bin. It's going to return an int. Because what we're going to do is we're going to enter the binary number as a string, and then we're going to process that string to convert it into a base 10 binary number pardon me, into a base 10 decimal number. Now, in order to do that, we first of all declare uh, an inter integer deck with a value of zero. That's going to be our decimal number. Uh, I determine the length of the string and subtract one from it to determine what the, uh, the, the, the last bit value is. Uh, if you have a... <clears throat> A binary number that consists of uh, five bits, for example, a five bit binary number, or how about an eight bit binary number? If you have an eight bit binary number, as you know, the highest bit value uh, is a seven because the eight bits in a binary number are, are numbered seven, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and zero, from seven down to zero for the eight bits. So um, what I wanted to do is we don't necessarily have to work with an 8-bit number. And so I wanted to take the length of the binary string and uh, subtract one from it to determine what the highest bit value is that we have to uh, process. Uh, I set an exponent equal to zero. And now we have a, a, a while loop that's going to carry on while the last bit is greater than or equal to zero. So what this should do is it should take us through the each bit in the binary string. And what we'll do is we will uh, read the character that's at that location in using the char app or char app method of our string. That, that'll read the individual character in the string. And if we detect a one, which means the bit is on, of course, what we'll do is we'll add on to our deck variable, with the plus equals operator, we'll add on two to the value of the exponent. The exponent starts off at zero because we're, we're gonna be going from right to left through the um, binary string. We add one onto the exponent in each loop cycle and we reduce the uh, bit value by one in each uh, loop cycle as well. And we end up with a decimal number that we can return back to the main function. Now, um, 
It's a little bit complex, but I think if you if you if you were to work it out on a piece of paper, how you would convert a, a binary string into a, a base ten decimal number, it'd be, it would kind of go like this, I think. And by the way, that's a very good way to solve a, a method if you have a, in a problem. Sometimes the best thing you can do is uh, step away from the computer and grab a pencil and paper, and work out uh, the pseudocode if you like work out the series of steps and do a, a bit of uh, figuring with uh, numbers and so on and uh, work it out work it out on paper and then you'll be able to write the method much easier um, now there's this thing in uh, in java and some other programming languages where you can have more than one method with the same name which seems kind of strange Notice this method here was called bin to deck. Well, I made another example, a rather silly one, actually. Another method with the same name. That's called method overloading. And you can do that in Java. You have to do it for your assignment, in fact. And in, in order to do it, you, the only way you can do it is if you have a different set, a different parameter list. The parameter list has to be different. You'll notice that the parameter list for the second method has an extra parameter, int dummy. Well, it's actually a, a variable that I'm not even going to use at all, which is why I called it dummy. But it does have a different parameter list from what we have up here in the first bin to deck method. And so Java allows it without, without giving me an error message. If I were to take this out, I'll just do it briefly here. You'll notice that I start to get error messages, little red indicators that uh, uh, we can't do this. Let's see what the message is. Duplicate method. Yeah, can't have an exact duplicate method because you have to have a different, different parameter list. So I'll restore it again here. And let's take a look at this one. What I did with this one is I did it with a for loop. Instead of, instead of using a, a while loop, I did it with a for loop. And um, uh, I don't know if we covered this when we talked about for loops, but it is possible to have more than one declaration. Like there's the first semicolon in my for loop. And you notice that I've got a variable called exponent, but also another one called dex, which is going to be the index that I use for uh, uh, the uh, index in, in this string. And um, we're, we can also modify both of those after the second semicolon and modify the value of the exp variable and the mod and the text variable we're going to uh, reduce one by uh, we're going to decrement one and we're going to increment the other and similar logic uh, as back in the previous program if we detect a one using char at in the string then we'll uh, add that value onto our deck variable and return the deck so it turns out uh, that the code is simply just a little bit simpler with the for loop, which is often the case, by the way. But I wanted to demonstrate overloaded method. This is called overloading, and it's very common in the Java API, the classes that are uh, come with Java when you install Java, which there are thousands of them in the Java API. Many of them use overloaded methods. They have some methods might have five, six, seven, or eight, nine methods with the same name in the same class, but they would all have a different parameter list. That's the requirement. Okay, so let's uh, let's run this thing. And see see if it uh, works. Which I believe it does. Let's give it a try here. Okay, uh, I'll just try something real simple, like it. one, one, one. You may know that that is seven because it's one plus two plus four. So that does work out to seven in base 10. So we get this, the uh, same answer using both, both methods. Uh, what I did up here is I, I, I used the first method. And then when I used the second method, which required that second uh, argument, right? Now we're gonna call it an argument. All I did was put a zero in here because I'm not gonna use it anyway. Wouldn't matter what number I put there because we're not using that dummy parameter at all. But we're using the second method there. So this one uses the for loop. And as you can see, we got the same answer from both. So I guess I guess this is working. <clears throat>
good way to test it too is to try. Uh, so you might know. Does anybody remember what five, uh, what eight uh, ones gives you? If all eight bits are out, you want to know what that is in base ten? Uh, no. No, nobody remembers that one. It's a good one to know if you're into networking. If you're going to be a networking professional. This will help you understand routers. It's two fifty-five. That's a number that you've probably seen if you've been poking around at IP addresses in IP version four. That's the highest number you'll ever see in an IP version four address because it's the biggest number you can get with an eight bit byte. Anyway, uh, enough about that. But I wanted to demonstrate overloading and also that um, you can do some pretty complex stuff with methods. The reason that Java programmers use methods is to uh, divide and conquer applications. Um, any application these days of any importance is done by a team of programmers, as I'm sure you know. And usually what happens in a Java programming shop when the, uh, a team is working on a new application, they'll say, okay, Jim, you're going to work on these methods, and uh, Mary, you can work on these methods. and uh, somebody a project manager overseeing the whole thing puts it all together and uh, at the end and but each each person is responsible for part of the application and usually that's broken up by having each person being responsible for several methods in the application so it's important to be become a good method writer in java and the purpose is to divide up a big application you don't want to write everything in main, obviously. So what you do is you write separate methods instead to get jobs done. And that's about all the uh, stuff that I wanted to show you. Now there's more, certainly more content in the uh, chapter. There are some uh, other good examples in there that Liang uh, gave us. But um, this covers, I think, the most important points. And I guess the most important points, back in, going back to methods one, you've got to keep all this in mind. You've got your void methods, your value returning methods. The, when you uh, define a method, you give it parameters. Some, sometimes a method doesn't take any uh, parameters though, right? It's not unusual either. When you actually go to use the method, you call the method, you provide arguments, and they have to match the parameters in type and in the order. You've got to get the order the same as in the uh, parameter list. And I guess that's most of it. Make sure you, your methods are static. If you forget to put static in there, you, you, it's not going to work. If you, if you write yourself a method and you say, public void without the static in there. Uh, it's not going to work. Watch what happens if I take that out and try to run it up in main. It's going to fail. Yeah, see up here. Doesn't want to use that. Can't run it. Let's see what the error message is. Can it make a static reference to a non-static method? So this method here has to be defined as static. And by the way, static, in case you're wondering what that word static means, it simply means that the method belongs to a, a class. So for example, the, the void method here, pardon me, the main method in, in class methods one, it's defined as static, which means it's, it's a method that belongs to the method one class. So you'll see that used throughout Java. Later on, we're going to be writing our own Java classes to describe data in the application that we're working on. We'll create classes to model the application that we're working on. For example, if we were working for a, an automobile dealership in Java, we, we would probably make classes, a, a class called automobile, in which we would try to define the characteristics of, of an automobile, make, model, year, color, etc. And when we do that, that method uh, would not 
would not be that would not be a static class. It would have methods within it that uh, we could then use in main. Use it to create objects. Well, that's all I have. That's all I have. Uh, no more new stuff. Any question about any of that, folks? Nope. Okay. Okay, Madhu. Okay, uh, Zane. Everything's fine there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mic well, not working real good. Pardon me, sir. No, I'm just saying my mic wasn't really working. Oh, okay. No, I hear you fine. Yeah. I can hear you fine. Okay, well, I'm going to, uh, this This is being recorded, and it'll take a, a minute or two for me to get it up onto YouTube and so on, but I'll do that, and then I'll put it in uh, our course, and where I'm going to put it, by the way, is <clears throat> if I go to the table of content, contents in our course, in my courses, there should be links and resources down at the bottom, or something called links and resources, and if we open that module up, as soon as, uh, as soon as my courses catches up to me here, I'll try to show you, but I'll, you'll see a list inside that module of it's at the top here. Yeah, there's the lesson we had in four or five. It'll, I'll put it at the top. Each each week, the lesson will be at the top of the list. So the uh, the lesson that we're doing right now will be up here if you want to review it later. All right, then. Keep, keep busy. And uh, remember, you can redo your assignments. Uh, I, I, I suppose it's uh, aggravating if you don't get full points when you do your assignments the first time. But look at that as a learning opportunity. That's the way I like to look at it. That's the way programmers work. Programmers almost never get their programs right the first time, even if they do get the program exactly the way their customer wants it in the initial meeting where it's decided upon uh, how you're going to proceed. Typically, when you actually uh, showcase the application to your client, to your customer, they'll say, oh, I thought we'd do this, or could you do this? And so you're always updating. You're always improving upon your code. And that's why I like you to do redos, so you can improve upon your code. And it gives you an, an excellent opportunity uh, to learn Java better. Okay, we're done. So um, yes, for, for one of the redos, I only send it uh, that one, like that one program, not like the whole thing would that be an issue that's okay yeah yeah if you have a redo sure just just uh, just send the one program that you had to redo not necessarily all the programs yeah that's okay. no problem okay and last week's assignments haven't been um graded yet right uh perhaps let's have a look uh, if we go to the submission review I don't have chapter five. I've got 22 of them done, only three of them. I've got 19 of them done, three of them not graded. Perhaps perhaps yours is one of them. Okay. Yeah. And these are these look like redos that are showing up here from previous weeks. And I see somebody's already done uh, chapter six. That's, that's cool. Okay. Well, I'll try to get those done in the next day or two. Um, okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Have a good, good night. Good All sign right. out. Brad out. Nothing.